On this episode of Aviator Cast, I have my video editor Jacob with us, and we're going to talk about kind of his thoughts at the beginning of flight training. Welcome, aviators, to another episode of Aviator Cast. Load up your flight bag with useful flight training topics, interviews, and aviation fashion. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Coming to you from Angle of Attack headquarters in Homer, Alaska, here's your host and flight instructor, Chris Palmer. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Chris Palmer from Angle of Attack and Aviator Cast. Great to have you here today. So I'm with Jacob. He is uh, my video editor that helps me put together videos, um, helps me put out more content. But he's also very interested in aviation. In fact, we both met when when I put out something on Instagram that said, hey, mm -hmm. any video editors out there? Yeah. And you were one of the first to, to write me. So um, I just wanted to, to get your thoughts today on on where you're at like mentally in the beginning of your training before you're getting into anything because you have you've never like fl flown right mm, no nothing in a logbook or anything nope no hours log nothing like that just from uh, and i've told you a little bit this but i have family that two of my cousins both are uh, private pilots and have flown a lot and it was fun to watch their journey through that and I have a family history in aviation too and it's always been something that i've been interested in and have passion for um, so it's something I've wanted to pursue and then and finding this connection with you has brought me even deeper, been a deeper dive into it, you know, really seeing it and being able to go through all the flight footage and really see the behind the scenes of it and um, feel like I'm already picking stuff up. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Osmosis. So kind of a small world, his, his uh, uncle runs an avionics shop in Alaska that I had gotten a transponder done there and yeah like we had that's a pretty tight connection yeah <laughs> like that's because that's where a lot of your aviation connection comes from right like, yeah absolutely from I mean, i've grown up and this is funny too i've grown up going to alaska and going to homer pretty much every year since i was born um so it was, it was really funny when i first found you to see that and then have that connection of my uncle too but yeah i mean i've grown up going to his avionics shop and being there and even a couple summers was there for a couple weeks that I'd stay with them and uh, just watch them do their thing and learn from them and stuff like that. So I've always been around planes and in them in some sense of being in the shop, but uh, haven't had any actual flight time under my belt yet. Yeah. So the plan is for for him to come to Alaska and do a lot of flying, and we're gonna we're trying to figure that out. We've been talking about this at our at our meeting the last twenty four hours. <laughs> so um, let's let's dive in a little bit to your training. Or not so much your training, but but like where your headspace is at. So, so leading up till now, because you wanted to do this for a while, like right, like mm -hmm. I don't know how long, but um, what's been preventing you from like starting so far? You know, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is the cost of it, right? It's it's a big cost, especially when I don't foresee it being a career opportunity. It's more for fun or for hobby or something like that, really other than our connection from a video perspective. But as far as actually getting my license goes, I don't I don't foresee that leading into a career or anything like that. So from that perspective, it's just a big cost for just something that's a hobby or that, you know, maybe I won't even fly that often. I like, probably won't buy a plane anytime soon or anything like that. So that's been one thing is just the cost. Mm -hmm. And the other has been probably the time that it takes to put in, right? Putting in all this time and money for something that I don't like I think I'll use and it'll be fun and cool to have that sort of thing but there isn't really like an analytical reason to get it other than just like for my own self-fulfillment yeah that's true and, and you know like you're at the age where do you care if I tell him your age no. he's 21 <laughs> <laughs> so he's still young um, you're still at the age where like life is pretty simple you're married um, you got a dog even that complicates it a little <laughs> bit but yeah like life is still pretty simple where you can make it work if you want to for a hobby, but again, sometimes aviation is a rich man's game where you don't have to spend 13 grand, you know, right. to, or whatever it is, you know, it's not always 13 grand, yeah. but that's about what I figured out it is at my school to get your license. So it's definitely a process. Mm -hmm. um, as you were, were you doing any research before you met me, like how you're gonna get into it? I was. I had actually started talking to some of the local flight schools around okay. here, just getting bids and pricing and things like that, just kind of figuring out what plans they had. Especially because being self-employed, I kind of have the flexibility as far as scheduling things and when I can go in and how often I can to where I could be more aggressive with it if I wanted to. And 
not that it's a good thing to rush or go try and pack it in no short amount of time, but um, I have the flexibility to do that. But I had talked to um, a local flight school at Palomar Airport. I had taken my drone Part 107 license through there as well, so mm. kind of been in there before and kind of seen what they are like. Um, that's basically the extent of actually like legwork going out and talking to people. Other than that, just kind of online research about um, you know the steps and plans and you know is this something I should be doing? Isn't it something I should be doing? Uh, and kind of what to expect and you know watching YouTube videos like yours, yeah. um, just to educate myself ahead of time and just you know get a deeper sense of what does this entail? Is this something that looks interesting to me still? And then go from there. Were there any drawbacks or things that were like holding you back in that process? Like, I don't know, like who you talked to at the flight school or lack of information? Like, what was your feel of, of things out there as you went through it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely was a little tough in the beginning. I felt like it's just like, this such a big thing that I'm diving into and looking at, especially being, I mean, I've probably been looking into this for about a year. So newly married, I'm like, hey, can I go spend, you know, 13 grand or whatever <laughs> it is to go and get my pilot's license that, you know, probably fly an hour a month or less, yeah, but yeah. whatever, you know, and actually have it. So, um, it definitely was a little bit of a process. It just seems like it's such a big daunting thing and that there's so much that I need to learn and find out about it. And it's like, okay, there's so many different resources. It's kind of like, but there, there are, and there aren't, um, so many different places. And it's kind of like, who do you trust? What do you listen to? What's yeah. the right information? What's not. And even at the flight school, you know, there was some like lack of communication, even just in like the early stages. It also seemed very outdated. Like they handed me a like a, a folder with like pages that you could tell have been copied like 12 mm -hmm. times and the ink's all faded and stuff like that. It's like, I don't even know if this is up to date information that I'm reading here, but whatever. And it kind of sounds like they're doing better than most. <laughs> <laughs> they actually had something organized to hand you. Well, I mean, it was just like a green folder with like yeah. papers in it that they had downloaded from online, like a hmm. pricing sheet or something like that. But still it was like, I just felt like even I'm a very like digital person, technology person. I go on their website and like the website is like 20 years old. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't really find any information. Like it was just kind of like digging to try and find anything. So that it was definitely a, challenging process until I started, you know, actually talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just kind of worked out to do that. And now you have to, you have to watch everything I do. I mean, thankfully <laughs> not like beginning to end. You're my biggest fan and we don't even know it. Um, yeah, that's cool. Like, I mean, a, a lot of the times people, when they go through their, that initial process, it is confusing because mm -hmm. there are different ways to do it. You know, there's part 61 and part 141. We talked about that. There's, you know, the recreational route, which you're going mm -hmm. for, or the professional route, which would be more um, like doing it for a career. Right. So yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of different advice and different ways people do things. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and kind of what we're talking about doing is is unique in that like your plan is actually to come to Alaska for a, a bit of time mm -hmm. and do your training there, which I've had several students do that, that can work remote like you, which is a really good situation. And something I did, like I did my, I did my commercial CFI and CFII all out of Alaska. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to broaden my experience, but I could also go and seek out the best flight schools out there. I know that's not an option for everyone, but right. um, if you're listening and you haven't thought of that before, that's always something that you can try to figure out to do. Um, so let's talk about just briefly, and I may, may even back uh, backtrack to the beginning of kind of your thoughts and stuff, but I think we might have covered that. Um, so we're talking about doing everything within a month time frame, mm -hmm. your license. That's kind of what we talked about yesterday, and we yeah. just briefly covered it. So what are your thoughts on that? Like when you hear a month and you're going to be training, like how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I mean, I think it's a little confusing because you hear the 40-hour the requirement, right? You're mm -hmm. like, okay, well eight hours a day, five days, you know, let's knock it on five days straight, just go crazy. <laughs> but, you know, obviously I know that's not you know, reasonable to shove yeah. eight hours of training each day in and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And there's a lot of on the back end stuff that I've learned that I need to do my own study on the back end um, when we're not actually out flying. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I don't know what to expect. It seems like from hearing from you, that's a pretty aggressive timetable probably yeah. to do it. Um, and you know, I'll have a little bit of flexibility to go longer than that if we need to, but um, it, it's, it's hard to look at it from the outside without not really knowing 
that and just being like, okay, well, two hours a day seems manageable or three mm -hmm. hours a day seems manageable. And, um, you know, well, do that for 10 days or something, you know, you're not most of the way there to the 40 hours requirement or whatever. Yeah. But I know there's a lot more than just hitting that number. It seems yeah. like, like I said, like, I don't know a ton. But yeah, there is. And, and so just to, to tell you, like, for every one hour of flying you do, typically you have three hours of study. Like, you know, I've already told you, you need to get your light, your um, written test done. Mm -hmm. But even then, looking at maneuvers and studying things again and like applying it to the actual airplane, if you want to do it like really tightly, then that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. Which is probably not, like for you, it's probably not exactly going to be that ratio because you're young and you can still learn really well. Um, we are going to be on a compressed timetable, which means you're going to be taking advantage of recency of experience. Mm -hmm. We are going to try to shoot video the whole time. So you're going to have the opportunity to actually for your study, watch the video of your last lesson, right. which helps you retain that quite a bit. So I think, I think there's definitely more wiggle room in there, but you know, then, then we have time built in for maintenance issues. If there are any for weather, which will absolutely happen. Um, for my family stuff, which I've got to still keep up on, um, you know, there's just a, like a long list of things that, mm -hmm. that that's a pretty comfortable timetable. But so just to backtrack a little bit, when I was talking about going somewhere and doing training, I just want to warn people that there are a lot of places out there that'll say they can do a private pilot in two weeks. And I can tell you right now that you will not get in-depth training by doing that. You'll barely squeak by if you do end up getting it done and it's just not, not a super great program. So I definitely don't support that. But I know that for you, like coming to me, like I can, I know that I can like create my own program that way, but I'm also not telling you we can do it in two weeks. Like that's right. not a possibility. Yeah, yeah, you're very upfront about that. You're like, we need at least a month if not more. Yeah. Like we don't want to rush this. We want to take our time and do it right. Yep. I feel like too, I'm, the reason I want to come up there to do it remotely instead of just finding somewhere here, even though it's two very different places as far as airspace and yeah. traffic and things like that go is, I've grown up going to Alaska. Mm -hmm. I know the area. I love Homer. I yep. love it there. And it's also very, in a sense, rough flying from the standpoint of you know, flying to you know grass strips or things mm -hmm. like that, and just dealing with potentially people that might not be on radios all the time, or just like you deal with very rare situations. I feel like yeah, and even with weather, with you know potentially the winds and things you can get in Homer, mm -hmm. I feel like it could be much more aggressive there than weather situations that we'll probably be faced with here in Southern California in some aspects. I think that's number one. I think number one is the weather that you face there, mm -hmm. because down here, I mean it was raining my whole drive down here and I was just blown away because yeah. I've had so many sunny days in <laughs> California uh, that it's just been crazy to see that. So yeah, weather there is always a factor. Like every single day, it's like, hey, are we gonna fly or not? Because yeah. there's probably gonna be weather. Summer's a little bit better in, in August, which is what we're talking about, is an amazing month. It's my favorite month in Alaska. Um, so I think we're gonna be set up pretty good there. Mm -hmm. We've got longer days as well. Um, you know, anywhere you train is going to have the different, the different challenges. Mm -hmm. So the challenge down here is the busyness. Mm -hmm. It is very busy. And in like your airport here, we were looking at it on four flight, um, Oceanside airport, mm -hmm. which it, it is, it's, I don't know if that's where you'll actually fly eventually, right. or if you'll fly out of Palomar, but <clears throat> it's right up against the restricted area of, uh, Camp Pendleton and right up against their class Delta airspace. Mm -hmm. So you're like sandwiched in between everything. And if you go any distance south, then you're getting into Bravo for San Diego. Right. So that in and of itself is a completely different thing that Alaskans would be like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die if I yeah. go down there and talk on the radio. And that's the cool thing, using your license to like fly in different locations is you, you, take, you take what's useful from there. Right. So, cause down here, I mean, to have the weather the weather and the wind and, and that sort of, and the short fields that we'll go into have that sort of experience is going to be something you have in your back pocket, Yeah. but you'll be terrible on the radios for a while. Right. And I guess <laughs> I'm, and it's interesting because I'm not so concerned about penetrating airspace or the radios or anything like that. Like I feel like I could learn those things and figure those things out, but it's knowing I want to train in like the harshest conditions from a flying standpoint and just the craziest things that probably won't have to do a lot of times. And that's, 
even when I got my driver's license, I learned to drive in a stretch bed F-350 dually Damn. truck. Like, that's what I drove in. <laughs> that's how I learned to drive. And it was like the harshest driving conditions, that's the fun. biggest truck on the road, you know? So it's like, it's almost in that same way. Like I want to set my standards high for um, learning and not harsh conditions, but you know, different conditions and push myself. So I have those things in my back pocket and yeah. I do them. And, and I think what you learn pretty quickly with me is that um, I'm really big on the fundamentals of flying the airplane and, and that that simplicity of how to fly the airplane will carry through no matter where you go. So right now it may seem, you, you know, you know Alaska, so you've been there when there's been crazy storms and weather. You were just there a couple weekends ago. Mm -hmm. But I think once you, once you get like maybe halfway through the training, you'll realize this isn't so bad. Like the right. conditions aren't as bad as I thought they would be but I know how to fly this airplane really well and I can take that with me forever. Like no matter where I fly, I'm gonna right. know what the wing is doing and what what I should be doing, which I, what I should be looking out for. So that's my initial goal, especially before solo, is for you to kind of come to that place. And then from there it's, you know, doing cross countries to see yeah. your uncle and, yeah. <laughs> and stuff. So yeah, cool. Um, so what else, are, is there anything else you're apprehensive about when it comes to flight training that you're, that you have questions about or? I mean, really it's hard because with the accessibility of YouTube and things like that and the amount of people that do post videos and things on there, I do listen and watch a lot of those things. Sometimes people that are in really busy airspace and intentionally seeking out those videos of people that are flying into Deltas and Bravos and areas like this so I can listen to the radio calls and hear how they request different things, whether that's flight following or just going through busy airspaces because I, I like to listen to ATC and just hear um, that. So I, I am interested to see how what I think I've picked up from YouTube translates to actually being in a cockpit. Yeah. Because I, I feel like I know stuff I and mean, I don't want to like go out there and be like, oh, I know what I'm doing because yeah. I don't at all. But I want to. I'm really interested to see how what things I think I picked up from watching videos on YouTube or training or different situations, and how those translate to doing that. Especially because I see how much of your flying happens, and I see the procedures and the checklists and things like that that happen, and I see it from engine start to you know shut off at the end. Like I see everything yeah. sometimes. So I really get to watch it all the way through, and it, it's different because I can't be manipulating the controls to feel. Yeah, like that, but I can see when someone's doing something, the suggestions that you make and things like that in those situations. So, I mean, I, I'm apprehensive to, I don't want to be overconfident getting yeah, it the good. first time. And that's where it's like, I'm trying not to think that I know anything because I don't want to think that I do and get in there in that situation. But I'm also interested to see, you know, just from, like I talked about, from seeing what I've seen on YouTube and learning things like that, how that will translate. If yeah. that'll be a good thing that I know some of that stuff, yeah. or if it won't, we'll have to you know re write over all that stuff. Yeah, I think that's a really healthy perspective because that's exactly how I would approach it. Is a, you know, you're getting a lot of things from osmosis already, or you already have a head start in the fact that you have a, you know, kind of an aviation family that you're in. At least some people are in aviation, so you've been around it, and then um, you have your drone license, you know those things are a head start. Like you've already started to learn some of the material. So you kind of know what you're getting into there. And then YouTube and online information, which can be good, but it's often incomplete, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of good stuff there. Like I, you know, I often give people the advice that they should be on YouTube, just especially when you're at, not flying or you're getting ready to fly to start mm -hmm. to absorb that. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot to learn there. Um, I'm going to bring up this. I think it's okay to bring it up because I have to say something about it, but I don't know how much I want to say about it, but this will be enough to just touch on. There is a recent video on the impossible turn, mm -hmm. which is probably a really good example of learning something on YouTube, but also being apprehensive about how good the information is. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I had asked you or shown it to you and asked you if you had seen it and you had. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that just for a few hot seconds. So when you saw that impossible turn video, what were, what was your take on it? Initially it was like, Hmm, wow, it's weird. It's called the impossible turn is it just doesn't seem like it's that hard to make. Right. And I mean, again, not having zero flight time, right. 
that's my perspective looking at it goes, oh, well, he made that just fine. He makes it seem like it's easy anything, you know, something anyone can do. Right. Just boom, make that turn, you're safe. Like, there's nothing to worry about. No mm-hmm. need to call it impossible. But then the more you, like, kind of dive into it, and especially talking to you, it's kind of like, well, one, what's his experience compared to someone that doesn't? What is the aircraft that he's flying? Mm-hmm. And in this situation, it was, you know, a bush plane, right? Made for harsh, adverse types of situations. Yeah. High Not lift a, on a, the exactly. wings. Exactly. Not a, lightly loaded. <laughs> exactly. You know, if you tried that in a different plane or had no experience doing that, you'd probably stall in, in yep. a turn. Yep. So, um, it, it, it's scary from the standpoint of, wow, I could have been influenced enough by that to try it if I wasn't really thinking into this enough. Because that was probably my first thought is, okay, well, if I ever hit the situation, right. do I want to make that turn as long as I don't pull back because yeah. I'm in that sharp bank, I'm not going to stall and be fine. Yep. Right? And so looking back on it, especially if I've talked to you more, it's kind of like, wow, that's really scary that you know, I was influenced enough by this one video on the topic, even though I've seen 10 about why not to do it. Yeah, exactly. The one pushed me in the direction of this is a possibility of something that you could do if you had to. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and I don't necessarily want to like rag on that one video. It's just, it's like, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Like I want people to take my stuff with a grain of salt. I, I say that there are very few absolutes in aviation. Very few. Mm-hmm. One absolute is that you will stall the wing if you keep, you know, like if you pull it past a critical angle of attack, which right. is my exact problem with that particular video because mm-hmm. not a lot of people understand that yeah. and understand how it's all working together because you know like when you and I when we go up and do steep turns we're going to do it with power on we're going to be at like above 1500 feet mm-hmm. we'll probably be more at like 3000 feet and so we have plenty of space that if anything happened if we got into a spin or, mm-hmm. or whatever else we could get out of it and be just fine but when you're that close to the ground you're, you don't have options and that's why the industry as a whole at some point called it the impossible turn so that it was just very clear to people not to try it because so many people were dying yeah. trying it and and just like the lowest common denominator right yes like i could maybe do it maybe i'm not even saying i could um i could maybe do it in a plane like that um i know i couldn't do it in my airplane yeah. in the 172 right for a variety of reasons that i could yeah. get deep into but the whole point is is that you know we just we got to take everything with a grain of salt. Yes. And, and so I like exactly where you started several minutes ago and that you are getting a lot of great information. You feel like you have a head start, but you're, you're second guessing and, and being careful with that confidence that you have in that information. So I think, I think that's a healthy place to come from because I'm not going to tell everyone that just like, don't watch YouTube, right. you know, do your flight training with someone and don't look at anything out there. That's not, how this works. It takes a, it takes an airport to raise a pilot, kind of like it takes a village to raise a child. You sure. know? So, yeah. yeah. And I like to also like kind of cross check the information that I find on YouTube with several different independent sources of, you know, different people that post that type of stuff. So I can see how, you know, four or five or six different people might do the same thing or approach the same situation. A lot of times it's the same. Sometimes it's different in forms of execution, but um, yeah, I just like to, I like to, you know, take it with a grain of salt, like you said. Yep. Yeah, that's real important. Um, so to kind of wrap things up, um, you and I haven't talked about this, but let's talk about follow through because mm-hmm. we've talked about a little bit of a plan. Mm-hmm. You've got some inspiration to do it. Like you've got a, a bug for aviation that you're trying to take care of. So we've got like an opportunity in front of us and I'm not asking you to like commit right here. That's not what I'm yeah. doing, but I'm, I'm more bringing up like the follow through of how you take that and actually make it happen. So, um, it's kind of a weird question, but what is your plan to make sure that Jacob actually does this? You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause this is something that I, I like, I, I think you actually will, yeah. but this is something a lot of people struggle with. They come, they sit on the fence, they, they like aviation, blah, 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 but they're not willing to put in the work. So what is it that you're going to do to make sure it happens? Even if you don't do it. Um, Probably one, buy a ticket. I just start the process because I know I'm going to do my training with you. Yeah, so lock down those dates as soon as possible. The other thing too is I feel like I'm accountable now as I've started telling people that I'm probably going to be doing this and going up to Alaska and something like <laughs> that. And it's like, now they're going to be asking me about it. And yeah. it's gonna, you know, so it's not just something I'm keeping to myself anymore. 
it's like I've kind of told people, hey, I'm probably going to be going out for a little while to do this. And it's something that I am really um, wanting to follow through with, especially because I have the flexibility to do it. So I think it's really just taking the steps and like scheduling the dates, booking the tickets, maybe booking non-refundable tickets, like they don't have a way out. <laughs> yeah. And just, just taking the leap and going for it. Yep. Yep. Perfect, man. It's like you took the words out of my mouth. It, <laughs> it's always about those little steps, right? Like the things that move us in the right direction. Um, I had the snowflake analogy on the podcast the other day that several people liked. It's like adding one snowflake at a time, eventually you get a big pile. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what learning aviation is, is all about. And, uh, yeah, I mean, taking those steps to like almost force yourself to, into that situation is is the best. Like yeah. that's what I've always done. It's like once I really commit, then I start to put the pieces in place, and you'll have to recommit yourself too because it'll <laughs> stuff will come up. Like yeah. you know, you and I and your wife have this common bond now because like the world went apocalyptic <laughs> last night with coronavirus. And we're like, what's going to happen to everything? <laughs> Where are we going to get our toilet paper? Exactly. 7-Eleven. Yeah, 7-Eleven. <laughs> we found toilet paper at 7-Eleven. So, you know, like things happen and, and, and they'll happen in your life. You have a pretty simple life right now, but mm -hmm. they can happen in your life. They can happen in a society, everything. Right. Like it can kind of go to crap. Right. But then it's like, okay, yes, that's a roadblock in front of me. How am I going to get around it, you know? that I build a great off-road vehicle that I can just like baha <laughs> off the road and then get back on Maybe track, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that's good. Step by step. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, just, I, I just wanted to have this conversation today to show you that there are other people that are going through this process in the very beginning and there's not always complete and total answers, but if you just take it one little step at a time, that's largely what my content is here for. So if you do have any questions, you can send me a direct message. Um, Jacob is helping me do Motivation Monday every Monday, which is where I answer questions about flight training and aviation careers. That'd be the perfect place to uh, ask some of the things that we kind of touched on today or whatever you're struggling with. And if you guys need any help along the way, just let me know. Direct messages on Instagram are one of the best ways to do that. Also, I have ground school, which is a big part. You're going through my ground school right now. We're even talking about ways to improve it. Uh, I have ground school on angleofattack.com that you can do video ground school and get your endorsement, which allows you to take your test. And that's what you need for the end of your, at the end of your license when you take your check ride. And then I also have check ride ACE, which is a preparation course if you're getting close to that. So um, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jacob, yeah, for thanks all for he does. Me. He's uh, he's magic behind the scenes right now. So he's really helping out with a lot of this content. So if you write nothing else in the comments, Right. Thank you, Jacob, for helping <laughs> us out with all this stuff. All right, guys, thanks for being here. And until next time, throttle on. We sincerely thank you for joining us on Aviator Cast. Please subscribe through your favorite podcast service and leave a review. Check out more flight training resources at angleofattack.com. There you can find this podcast, many free aviation training videos, as well as online ground school for private instrument, commercial, and CFI. Got a check ride coming up? Check Ride Ace from Angle of Attack is your ultimate companion, guiding you through the process so you can conquer your big day. Thanks once again for joining us on Aviator Cast. Turn left, contact Ground Point Niner.